Election observers are crucial in ensuring the public's confidence in the results of any poll. In fact, a free and fair election is the golden standard by which democracy is exercised and certainly measured. The IEC expecting about 6,000 observers to monitor more than 23,000 voting stations across all nine provinces in South Africa. The Electoral Institute for Sustainable Democracy in Africa has been observing these elections since back in 1996. Head of programs there is Grant Matheson. He joins us now via our video link from Johannesburg. And Grant, it's always great speaking to you, sir. Thanks so much for making time. South Africa, in many respects, seen as a beacon of hope. Some instances, the gold standard when it comes to conducting free and fair elections, at least on the continent. Perhaps it should come as no surprise that the IEC and SADC also have a good relationship when it comes to getting observers. Are you able to tell us why that is and whether or not we should expect observers from SADC for these municipal polls? Uh, I, I don't know that we will be expecting SADC observers on the ground. SADC has moved to uh, what they refer to as virtual observation in recent times. Um, so that, that would be my expectation at this stage uh, for, for what SADC is going to do. But you're right. You know, the, 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 the relationship that South Africa and the IEC has with observers is, is determined and set by the IEC itself, which has always been very accommodating and very welcoming of observers. Um, for any electoral commission, it's, a, it's an awkward thing to have the elections which you are running observed and critiqued and, and put under a microscope. But, of course, given the importance of the electoral process to a healthy democracy, um, it's well understood by the IEC that having um, uh, people on the ground and eyes on the, on the polls uh, is ultimately to the benefit of the IEC, to South Africa's democracy, and to, uh, to the electoral process itself. Yeah, and is there a strict criteria needed for an election to be declared free and fair? I mean, we, we kind of use this term quite loosely, and to many people I imagine it's quite elusive. Yeah, it is. In fact, uh, one of the things that ISA always does during our trainings is we ask our observers to, to tell, tell us what they understand by these terms, free and fair. It's a term that's fallen out of favor with, uh, with electoral observers. It's, it's not something that electoral observers will typically use in, in our language. Um, and so when you look at observer reports, you will often struggle to find that phrase, free and fair. Uh, it's, it's quite a nice... Um, a uh, pithy phrase that is, uh, is, is thrown around sometimes to try and summarize an immensely complex process with many moving parts uh, and many complexities um, to, to, to the average uh, um, voter to, to, to try and get a sense of were the elections good or not, because ultimately that's what it comes down to. Observers themselves perform a, um, a, a, a range of roles. There are, there are observer missions that come for political and diplomatic processes, uh, as well as observer groups that come uh, for learning processes. Uh, and then there are observer groups who only really focus on and examine the technical aspects of elections. So even amongst observer groups themselves, there are different ways of interpreting whether or not the elections themselves um, allowed for the will of the people to be freely expressed in those elections. Sure, that's interesting. Speaking about that, and you've already explained the dynamic between, for instance, uh, an electoral commission and observers. What happens in a context where an electoral commission, in our context, the IEC, declares that the election was free and fair, but observers disagree. Well, again, I think it's, it's, it's possible and it does happen. Um, the, the Electoral Commission will be bound by the Constitution, the Electoral Act, uh, and all of the uh, guiding stipulations within the um, South African legislation um, for how it is supposed to deliver on the election. So the IEC will take a, a particular view on how um, it has met the mandate uh, that is, is laid out for it in the Constitution. Um, and, of course, observer groups uh, have different criteria, as I've, as I've already indicated. So, for example, the African Union, when they observe elections, the African Union is, is deploying its observers to ensure that uh, the, the country which is a signatory to various African Union uh, declarations and principles is upholding the principles that they have signed with the African Union. Um, uh, whereas for ISA, our, our focus tends to be, as I indicated earlier, very much on the technical aspects of elections, whether or not um, the processes were efficient, whether or not the processes made sense, whether or not they encouraged transparency and openness and built trust in the elections. So again, uh, it's very possible for different groups to have different perspectives on the elections because they are placing emphasis in different areas of the election. Fascinating. You'll correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that municipal polls don't typically receive as many observers as the national poll. Now, many analysts will say that both 
type of elections have equal importance. So if this is true, why is that the case? So I think that the, 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 the short answer is a practical one. Deploying election observation is not cheap. Mm. It's not quick. It's not easy. Um, and so when, when you're deploying um, uh, you know, hundreds or thousands of people around the country to observe an election, uh, there, there is a, a huge logistical process that goes into place there. And that's just a fraction of the logistical process, by the way, that the IEC has to deploy, uh, which I think highlights the complexities that they deal with each time they run an election. So the African Union took a principled decision to observe all national parliamentary and presidential elections in the country, uh, and that has come at a huge uh, financial and, and human cost to the AU. Um, they have, uh, since about 2013, managed to very effectively meet that uh, sort of decision in principle. Uh, but, of course, you have to remember that the African continent has 55 uh, nation states, uh, and in, in any given year there can be upwards of 25 elections uh, across the continent. So that is a huge undertaking just for the presidential and parliamentary elections. Mm. If you were to add local government elections, uh, you would more than double the number of elections that the AU would be deploying to, which, of course, has very practical implications. Right, right. Um, and, of course, local government elections themselves are seen by many, I think incorrectly so, they are seen as sort of the poorer cousins of the national elections. Right, that's certainly the reading you get when you, I guess, come across this fact without the context you've just given. So uh, I guess, yeah, it's interesting to learn that it's actually more about practicality than the ranking of these type of elections. Uh, but very quickly, in our context, I mean, I'm sure you'll agree that the integrity of an election is determined not only about, not only on what happens on election day, but sometimes in the build-up to that moment too. In our context, we've already reckoned with things like political killings and the like. Should stuff like that impact the grading of how fair an election actually was? Absolutely. The, 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 the approach for all observers uses the electoral cycle model, which considers three periods which are key to an assessment of whether an election uh, allowed voters to express their will. Uh, and, of course, those are the pre-election phase, what happens on election day, and also, crucially, uh, how the results are managed, how they're calculated and how they are announced. So there's the pre-election, the election, and the post-election phase. All three are critical, uh, and so you view them all as one process. You don't try and separate them out. So absolutely, what's come uh, in the pre-election, uh, we've been giving briefings to the observers who've come in this week to try and catch them up on what's been going on in South Africa politically recently, uh, the issues with the courts, etc. It's all, it's all critical and all very important. And the, the overall report tries to form a comprehensive picture of how the electoral process started and how it finished. Grant Masterson, thanks so much for speaking to us. Really all interesting dynamics around the importance of observers as we come today is now to the local municipal polls. Grant is with the Electoral Institute for Sustainable Democracy in Africa. Once again, thanks very much indeed.